There can be no such thing as God because if God was real, there wouldn't be any evil. There can be no such thing as God because if God was real, He would have stopped this bad thing from happening in my life. If God was real, then this thing that's, that's really killing me at the moment wouldn't be here. If God was real, there wouldn't be any poverty. If God was real, there wouldn't be any pain. If God was real, there wouldn't be anyone ever being alone. If God was real, there wouldn't be people living on the streets. If God was real, my parents would never have split up. If God was real, we would never have broken up. If God was real, he would fix the problem that I have in my life. Now these might seem like logical statements, and it's probably statements we've all made before. Like, I've definitely, definitely made that statement before. It's probably the reason that I didn't believe in God when I was younger. Because, in reality, if you look at this world, it doesn't indicate that there'd be a good God. With that uplifting intro, my name's Alistair, and uh, tonight I'm talking about uh, why not? Talking about why not? Why not Jesus? And the topic I've got is if God is real, why do bad things happen to good people? It's a really heavy topic. It's really big and it's really broad and there's a lot of things that we need to get through. All of the queries that you have are logical. I want you to hear that. That your queries are legitimate. They are a legitimate reason for you not to believe in God until you hear what I have to say. So uh, I'm going to read from Matthew 12. I left my Bible at home, so I've got it on paper. I apologize, we'll have it on the screens for you. Um, talking about Jesus tonight, right? I don't know if you guys are on that team, I'm on that team. So I'm here to talk about Jesus. So the first word that we're going to talk about from the Bible tonight is Jesus. Uh, so Matthew 12, verse 15 to 21. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will help, hope. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you and I are Gentiles. That means we are, we are not traditional uh, people of God. Uh, and so we are, uh, in essence, not, not God's people. And why, why I brought up that passage is that sometimes life is hard. Sometimes we don't know what justice is and sometimes we don't know what hope is. I mean, you get different levels of hard. You get like our levels of hard and then you get like third world levels of hard. But for me, you know, I had a hard thing when, when I was in high school. I was really, really keen on this girl. I was like, you and me are going to get married. That's, that's how keen I was. I was so keen that uh, in year 11, I switched out of normal English into English literature just so I could be in her class. Like, I don't know about you guys, but that's commitment. Right? I, you know, that's, I hate English. I switched classes so I could, could be with this chick. Anyway, about halfway through the year, um, she signed into a thing called MSN. I probably don't even know what that is. You've got all Facebook messages and WhatsApp and Snapchat and such. But MSN was the thing when I was in high school. And uh, logs in and we start smashing the keys. I don't know about you guys, but when I get excited, I'm like, with a little Gatling gun on a keyboard. Like, oh, I type so fast. You know, that's just what you do. And I'm talking to this girl. And uh, I'm pretty keen, and I've, I've made it quite clear that I'm pretty keen. And uh, I was complaining about my parents, and I'm like, oh, look at how bad my parents are, look how badly they're treating me, look at all the things they've done to me, they're just horrible. And the reply I got broke me, broke me for a long time. All she replied was, did you ever think that maybe it's because you're evil? <laughs> like, there's differing levels of rejection, just rejection, like, no, I don't want to date you. That's, that, that's hard for anyone to take. There's the friend zone, right? Where you're like, oh, I don't want to date you, but I like you as a person. It's like, man, that's it. Then there's you are Lord Sauron who wants to destroy Middle Earth. Like, <laughs> of the differing levels of, of rejection, I was in the last camp. It was not a good place for me. And this was, I, I disagreed with this because I'm like, man, I'm a good person. What are you calling me evil for? Like, I feed my cat. That thing hasn't died yet. Like, 
I'm, I'm, I'm relatively a good person. And I think that, that that brings up the first point that we need to understand tonight, is that people are naturally bad. And God is naturally good. That is, people by nature and choice are not good. You can, you can see this in a five-year-old that bites his little brother's hand, right? <laughs> you, can, you can't tell that kid that he's being good by biting someone's hand. He's just being evil. That's just in our nature. And not only that, we choose to do it as well. We choose to voluntarily lie to our friends. We choose to voluntarily choose ourselves over other people. We do this all the time. So we are bad by nature and choice. God, on the other hand, has to be perfect if he is God. Because if God is not perfect, he is by definition not God. Because who the heck wants to worship someone that's not perfect? What's the point of, of worshipping a God that is not perfect? So therefore you've got two different camps. You've got perfect and you've got not perfect. If you want to simplify that, you've got good and you've got bad. We are in the bad category. Us as a collective group, as human beings, if you've got human beingness to you, then you're in that, you're in that camp. You're, you're bad. I'm going to tell you that now as an honest truth. I'm sorry. You too, like me, are Lord Sauron wanting to destroy Middle Earth. Right? That is us as a collective group. We are evil. We weren't always this way. If you go back to the beginning, back to the beginning, we can debate a long time on evolution and we can debate a long time on creation. But for the purpose of this, we were created perfect. That is, God created us in his image. Therefore, he gave us his conscience. He gave us his good will. And in God's perfection, he allowed us to have free will. With our free will, we chose against God. That is, we chose to do our own thing. And that made us evil. So we've gone from camp with God to without God. All right? that's, that's the first thing that we need to understand. We're going to be talking about three things tonight. Justice, wrath, and punishment. All right? And when you say that, I'm asking justice, wrath, punishment. Justice, wrath, punishment. No, no, no. Everyone's together. Justice, justice. Wrath, wrath, punishment. Punishment. It's going to be an exciting night tonight. I can tell already everyone's looking real excited. So let's quickly define these terms. We can't get into them if we don't just find them. So justice, you treat everyone equally. Collectively, treat everyone equally. Does everyone agree? Cool. Wrath is a deeply resentful and extreme anger. Deeply resentful and extreme anger. And lastly, forgiveness is releasing blame or wrongs committed against you or another party. Alright? So, a little bit of, little bit of definition action there. The reason we're going to talk about these three things is because we as people ultimately, when we say there can be no God because of the circumstances in my life, gentlemen down the front here, it's because we disagree with God's justice. We disagree with God's justice because we don't understand common grace. And common grace is that we as evil people all deserve to die. We don't deserve breath in our bodies. We deserve to be buried and left there for eternity. But God out of love allows us to live a life. And in that life, we get to make decisions. Okay? And that's God's first act of justice that he does not need to do. He allows us to live. All right? So we as people, I can tell you now, all seek justice. You can see this in your friends. When uh, one friend fights another friend, you want to see that friendship reconciled. Right? If we see a murderer, we want them to go to jail. We do seek justice. And we want to seek that people are equal. Whether or not you're a Christian, most people would say charity is a good thing, they don't want poverty to be here anymore, right? So people collectively seek justice. Um, the problem with that is that we don't have a mediator for justice. So for example, if we want to go into the shark cult, it is an act of justice to say that we should kill all the sharks because it protects people. It is also an act of justice to say we shouldn't kill the sharks because they're an endangered species. So both of those arguments are just and neither of them have justice in them. But the problem is that both conflicting. So you need to have a mediator. You need to have someone that is impartial and decides this is justice and this is not. Now let's, for example, call that God. Let's just say God says this is right, this is wrong. Let's, let's just say that as, as an example. 
then as an example, let's say Adam and Eve, let's just let's call them that, uh, they decide that that definition of justice is not good enough. They disagree with that justice and they do their own thing. Which is ultimately what we as people do every time. We look at God's justice and we say, I don't agree with God's justice, I'm going to do my own thing. As a result, we need to be punished. Right? We can agree that when someone steps out of justice, you want to see them punished. Correct? So what I want you guys to understand is that justice is not decided by people, but by God for people. God doesn't need justice because he's perfect. Because we are imperfect, we require justice. We require a standard set by someone who is impartial. The reason that justice is important is because it brings us to punishment. And this is a result of wrath. This is a result of you feeling hatred or anger towards someone else. You can see this in your own life. For example, uh, if someone steps on your toe, you feel <coughs> anger towards them and you don't want to forgive them, right? Because they've hurt you. If someone lies to you, if someone backstabs you, if someone is not honest with you, you are angry at them. You feel anger towards them. And this is a perfect example of how the Bible is still relevant, despite the fact that it was written 2,000 years ago. Because we can all agree that we feel anger towards people when we are wrong. Right? And that's why we don't forgive. And I think for some of us in this room, we've probably done, like, done that with God, but we've seen something happen in someone's life or in our own life, and we've said, we don't agree with this, God. I'm angry at you for what you have done. And we often hold God personally accountable for someone else's actions. For example, if you wake up in the morning and you are tired and you are angry and your mother says, I'm going to give you wholemeal bread instead of white bread on your toast this morning, you throw a hissy fit and say, Mother, you are a cow for giving me wholemeal bread. <laughs> That's not God's fault. In the same way, when she grounds you for the way that you have behaved, that's not God's fault either. That was your fault for being immoral, right? In the same way that God didn't make anyone kill someone, but they were punished for what they did because it was their choice. It's in the same way you can choose to lie to your friends, and that's not God's fault. That's you making that decision. So ultimately, because of that, we are all sinners. And that's the, the second important thing that you need to remember is that God created the people and the people have created the problems. So the inequality we see in this world between first world, third world, poverty and rich is because of people. It's not because of God. You can't blame God for the decisions that people make. This is where it gets weird. Because then you need to talk about forgiveness, right? Because that's the next step. If you've ever had an argument with someone, you, you want to seek justice, you, maybe your justice doesn't agree, so then you feel anger. Once you've gotten over the anger, you forgive that person and you release them from the blame that you hold against them. The problem is, we have sinned against someone perfect. Whereas when we sin against each other, when we hurt each other, we are doing it from one imperfect being to another imperfect being. Does that make sense? That God is perfect? That God is above us? And that the way that we deal with our own problems are not the same way that we can deal with God's? For example, we can't forgive God because God's never messed up. So God has no regard at all and he has no requirement to forgive us for what we have done. Does that make sense? God is perfect. God creates people as good people. Good people choose against God, become bad people. Those bad people then hurt one another, blame God. Doesn't quite make sense, right? And therefore, because of that, God has absolutely no requirement whatsoever to get involved with us at all. In fact, we all deserve to die. And if it wasn't for God's common grace, we would all be dead right now. But this is where Christianity is different to any other interpretation you'll ever hear about God. Every single interpretation of God in the whole world will tell you that we are not perfect. Every, every religion will tell you that. But what every religion will tell you is that you need to work your way to God. That is, if you do the right thing, if you 
don't do the wrong things, then you'll be fine. And God will love you. If you go to church every week, if you're part of a worship team, if you ignite every week, then God will love you. Which is not true. I have questions at the end. In fact, the basis for religion, the literal definition of religion, is earning your way to Jesus. Or earning your way to God. Instead, God sends himself, right? So God has already created us and he's already done what he needed to do for us. We choose against him. He then comes into this world where he has no requirement whatsoever to be involved with us. He comes into this world as fully God and he lives a perfect life. As we read earlier, he came here, he healed people, he proved that he was God. If you don't believe the Bible, it doesn't matter. You can read history books that will tell you that Jesus was here. You can read history books that will tell you about a man that was walking through places, teaching crazy stuff and healing people. You don't need the Bible to tell you that. What the Bible tells you is his identity. The reason that's important is that we as people deserve punishment. And instead of God punishing us, he punishes himself. So Jesus Christ, as fully God, comes into this world. He lives a perfect life. He does not sin once because he's God. He's perfect. He always forgives, never blames, always takes responsibility. He mans up and he lives his life as fully God. He's then crucified on a cross for crimes he did not commit. I don't know if you guys know what crucifixion means. It means you're whipped for about four hours with a, with a cat of nine tails, which has bits of bone and metal in the, in the ends that hook flesh out of your back. So like chunks of flesh, like the size of your fist coming out of your back. It happens for about three hours, and you're made to carry a heavy wooden cross up a hill. Uh, you're then nailed with uh, railway spikes through your hands to the cross, and eventually you suffocate to death. And then just to make sure, just to make sure after all of that, you are dead, they take a spike and they stab it up through your rib cage and through your heart sac uh, to make sure that your heart's completely punctured. So I didn't, I didn't realise that was funny. I, I, sorry, that just, to me that's not funny. It's just really not at all. In fact, it's so unfunny that, uh, that God makes a joke out of it. He says, you just try to kill God. And three days later, he rises from death. Here. Alive. Three days was the, the biblical term for death. In the time of Jesus, if you were dead for three days, you were officially pronounced completely dead. He was locked away in a tomb and was no longer in that tomb after three days. In fact, he showed himself to people. 500 people saw him. And what I want to tell you is that Jesus rose to come to the problem to fix the people. Every other religion will tell you that God is responsible for this earth and that we are responsible for getting our way to God. Jesus instead sees that there's a problem on this earth that we have created ourselves and he puts himself in the mix to fix our problem. I mean, some of you might, might be getting to this point and you say, that's not good enough for me. You haven't even answered my question. The fact that there are bad people in this world and that bad things happen proves that God doesn't exist. Maybe you think that God doesn't care about the bad things that happen in this world. What I would retaliate to you with is a, is a book in the Bible called Genesis. You guys know the story about Noah's Ark, right? What a lot of you probably don't know is the precursor to Noah's Ark. And that is God says the only intention of every person on this earth is only ever evil all the time. And I hate it so much, I'm going to kill them all. And he kills everyone except for one family. That's how much God hates the evil in this world. So if you think that God doesn't hate evil, you have a misconception of God because God hates evil so much, he killed an entire world's population because of their evilness. Right? So understand that God hates evil. But maybe that's still not good enough for you. Maybe you don't want God to kill all the people. You just want him to get rid of all the evilness in the world. And that might seem like a fair argument to you at first, but where do you stop? What defines evil? Is it the murder level? That guy killed someone. He's evil. God, you need to get rid of him. What if it's the anger level? You feel like you want to kill someone, but you don't actually follow through. Is that evil? What about the lying level? Completely leading people astray. Is that evil? So the problem is you put yourself down a wormhole where you say, get rid of all the evil, and we're all dead anyway. Because we're all evil. We all are responsible for the evil that we do. 
And lastly, you might say, well, there is sickness in this world. There is cancer in this world. There are people that abuse people in this world. And what I want to tell you is that we live in an imperfect world. We live in a world that was not as it was intended. And for me, I, I know personally people that have been sexually abused. And to me, it makes my blood boil, and I want to sometimes just go over to that person's house, like the person that abused them, and I, I tell you now, I'll kick them in the face, because I cannot stand the fact that there are people so evil in this world. But what the Bible tells me is that that person that sexually abused that person is the same as me lying to you. And God sees it as exactly the same. And the problem that we are in a perfect world, we are all on the road to death. Every single one of us is dying. 100% of people die. It's a new statistic. I don't know if you've heard of it. 100% of people die. There are sicknesses that make that death quicker. And there are some of us that are really healthy and make that death slow. But either either, we are all going to die. And it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we will be forgiven and have new life. Because no matter what we do in this life, it doesn't matter which boxes we tick. It doesn't matter if we go to church. Honestly, it doesn't. It doesn't matter if you come to youth every week. Ultimately, you need to understand that if you do not love Jesus, if you do not know Jesus, it's all a complete waste. A complete waste. And it's hard for us to swallow because we look at our world and we say, this world is imperfect and if God was good, he would fix it. But ultimately, we as people are responsible for the imperfection in this world. And God as God has no regard whatsoever for it. Instead, he chooses to love us and he chooses to be involved. So there's a few things you need to remember from tonight. That is, God is good and people are bad. God is good people are bad. Justice is divided, decided by God for people. Right? Justice decided by God for people. God created the people and the people created the problem. And Jesus came to the problem in order to fix the people. Does that make sense? Of course not. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane. That the fact that you and I, as imperfect people, are loved by a God who loves us so much. Um, and we've, we've covered an extreme amount of content tonight, and we've probably covered stuff that hit you on a personal level. Notice a lot of hands are coming up. So I want you guys to come down the front here once we're done, and I want to talk to you about those questions, because I'm sure those questions are valid. And I do want to talk to you about them, because the only reason I get up here is so that you guys can understand the truth that Jesus Christ is God and that Jesus Christ is King of the universe. Jesus Christ is a better King. Jesus Christ is a better Saviour than anything else that you will ever encounter. I know this in my own life. We can argue for days on whether or not the Bible is true. We can argue for days on whether my views on evil in this world is true. But what you can never take away from me is my experience of God, the way that He's affected my life. And I can look at my life and I can tell you there is no explanation for my life apart from God. There is none whatsoever. I'll tell you now, five years ago, I would not have been on a stage talking to a bunch of teenagers about God. 100% not on my to-do list. 100%. So I'm going to close in prayer, but if I've said anything tonight that has is, that is rattled you or has knocked your bones around, I want to talk to you about it. Because there's no point you walking out that door and not dealing with the issue. Because you guys, whether you know it or not, think like an adult. And you are cognitively able to make your own decisions. And you need to take responsibility for yourself. And you need to ask those questions. You need to seek the truth.